Three, two, one. This is The Jungle, an up-close, unvarnished look inside leadership and business strategy. We wade into the real world leader's face and explore what they do to create a path forward because that's what business is. Wild, exciting, it's The Jungle. And we are back in The Jungle. Derek, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, doing good. Do it, you know, middle, middle of summer here, Doug. It's hot in Michigan right now. A lot of rain, days. a lot of rain lately, too. Rain sun, rain sun makes everything green, very green in the dead middle of summer. So, does that how, how does that fare for your golf game? That now that everything's nice and green and the greens are really receptive, is that good for your golf game? Well, no, because the rough is really, really long and you know I don't hit it straight. So, that rough it's everywhere i play it seems like u.s open rough right now it's all thick and and long and they can't cut it fast enough and even my kids they, they play a golf match they can't swing out of that stuff you know and so you hit like, it you're like you're like bryson you hit it so far bombs down there that it doesn't matter for you right is that the yeah. isn't that the, isn't that the strategy uh, bomb and slash right that's what he said bomb it down slash it out of the rough is the, the price yeah it doesn't work for me i don't bomb it quite that far but um so, you know, it's just, it's a great summer in Michigan, a lot of rain this year, but uh, everything is green and it's going to have a hot days this week and it'll cool down by the end of the week. So it'll be nice, perfect weather. We're heading into August here in Michigan, which is my favorite month. Uh, although our guests had some pretty hot weather down in, in Atlanta, um, but a, but a, but a, but a Michigan, uh, Michigander probably at, at, at heart. Michigan at heart, Western grad. So two time. Two time Western Western grads and former MPI research employee. A little shout out to them uh, where you got to start. It's great to see him doing so well and being so successful right now. Uh, It's always great to talk to Western grads that are leading companies, big companies like the one that he's leading. So it's uh, yeah. So we so we had uh, the great honor of speaking with uh, John Cook, who is uh, senior vice president and CEO of Henry Shines Global. Dental Group. Now, uh, folks who might not know uh, Henry Shine, they're they're one of the largest, if not the largest, um, distributor of dental equipment and supplies in the world. Uh, this is a ten billion dollar company, and we have one of our our great Broncos, two time uh, graduate of the of the Hayworth College of Business who is CEO of, of that, that dental practice. Uh, really great resume. We, I won't go into it. Um, he's bounced around and, and really, I think it's a great example for our students on, on how you have you know, career success and, and, and learning and adapting through that process. But a, a great guest, uh, really interesting uh, story that he had about his, his career uh, and loved his, take, his, his kind of lessons on leadership. Uh, Derek, what were your takeaways? Yeah, so uh, I'll just go with, with, with one that I kind of, I've always believed in. Uh, the learners are the ones that succeed. Uh, and even said, you know, learners doesn't mean, you know, you open a book, you're reading books. I mean, I tend to be a little bit of a reader, but it doesn't mean you're doing that stuff. Always, it's, You're taking in your environment and being curious. So you always jumped around, you always took new jobs, and you just was a learner of the environment around them um, and, and just tried to, find best practices, find what worked, find what you like, don't like, uh, and never think you're, you're finished learning. Uh, you know, have kind of having that growth mindset. We've talked about that a lot of our guests. So I, I like that, you know, his curiosity is, is he said it right in the middle there, the learners are the ones that succeed in, in our society now with the way things change and move. So good takeaway there. What was your, what were you, Doug? What, what was your takeaway? I think I, I think I outed my takeaway in the actual episode, but I love this, you know, he, you know, the successful organizations push through uncomfortable barriers and they then ask, what else can we do? And I think so often we're quick to, you know, oh, good, it's over, but not not use it as a reflection that builds confidence to take the next risk, to take the next change, to move into a new territory. Uh, you hear, you know, some of the getting back to normal or it's the new kind of a new normal, but you don't, I don't often hear what he talked about that it's, it's, it's challenging the organization to go to the next step because the, of the success they had. So I really like that. Um, a, a lot you can, and, and, and that's, that's a lesson that applies both to businesses, but to people uh, individually. So I, 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 that was, that was my takeaway. Yeah. Uh, he, he was really good, really good. And you know, he's, he's where he is for a reason and um, super successful and, and came out of Western and, and, 
Henry College of Business. He also has very successful enough to start the uh, the, the Cook Family Scholarship. Um, uh, I went to one of our LBS students recently. That LBS student just landed their first great job. I mean, small scholarships like that and big scholarships like his, they all help, right? So, um, and, and help our students be successful. So it's, it's good to see the impact that he's being able to give back to Western because he's so successful. So yeah, very awesome, very, awesome guest. Very much appreciate the, you know, his support of LBS. Shout out to Jason Rose for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, love, love Jason uh, here at Western. Uh, so with that, I think uh, let's let everyone enjoy our great conversation with John Cook. The Jungle is produced by the Center for Principled Leadership and Business Strategy in Western Michigan University's Hayworth College of Business. Our center supports the leadership and business strategy major, conducts large-scale consulting projects, and trains professionals in acquiring and operating small businesses. To learn more, visit wmich.edu forward slash leadership center. John, welcome to The Jungle. Glad to be here. Do you have a beverage? Cheers. Uh, Cheers. I'm drinking wine today, Derek. It's, oh, it's right. four o'clock in the afternoon. I thought I'd go for it today. The rosé you're drinking? Is that, is that real wine? <laughs> rosé. It's rosé all day in the summertime. That's right. Uh, John, what do you, are you, is it, is it just water and hydration for you too early for a cocktail? It is. It okay. is. Okay. Uh, where is this podcast uh, finding you? Are you, are you at home? Where are you? Well, I'm not at interlock and I can tell you that. Okay. Um, Kind of bummed. Atlanta, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you bummed about that? Have you been to Interlochen? I have. What am I, I f- have. So I, I'd love to be there. And it's about to rain here. So, so maybe I'd really like to be there. Yeah. One of my favorite places uh, on earth, I would say. Just absolutely beautiful. It uh, sure is. So uh, what's the weather like down in Atlanta these days? You probably have nice, hot, summer, humid summer? or Hot, humid gorgeous uh, on most days but uh really nice but rain today okay so it's hot and rainy so maybe not all that different than michigan we've had a ton of rain are are we back in the office yet are we still working from home we're still working from home we we have a lot of team members that work in distribution centers or local centers around the united states but uh, many of us who are traditionally office based are working from home Huge, uh, I just saw some news, uh, I think on, I don't know when we'll release it. We're recording this on July 27th that we might be in masks again soon. So we'll again, be, we'll be very interested <laughs> to see where, where that goes. Um, so really appreciate you joining us uh, on uh, the podcast today. And we always love to have really successful WMU alums. And you're a two-time WMU alum. Uh, love to hear a little bit from you about your kind of journey to your success and, and where you are now, um, you know, starting with your time at Western. So I joined Western because I thought it was a great, uh, I looked around various schools in, in Michigan and uh, kind of came from humble beginnings in, in certain ways, right? We, we just didn't have uh, a lot of funds for, for, um, some of the, the universities that, that maybe I aspired to. And as I was looking around, guess what? Western actually was a gem. Uh, as I learned more about Western Michigan University, it just continued to pique my interest. And I talked to a number of people uh, at the business college you know, who were related to the school or educated at the school, and they just said amazing things. And so literally in my backyard, I had this fantastic uh, educational opportunity in Western and so uh, I went to Western, had what I thought was an amazing um, yeah, education experience, both socially and, and what the organization gave me in terms of a, a great business education, a good foundation to enter the business world. Had a wonderful time at Hayworth uh, School of Business and felt I, I got a tremendous education, really hands-on by the instructor, instructors and professors. And through that, I made a variety of connections. And I actually, it kills me, but I can't even remember the, the name of the professor, but he referred me to an organization that was looking for somebody in finance in the community. It was MPI, uh, a pharmaceutical research company based out uh, in Matawan. And he referred me to these two gentlemen who had just bought the company. And I met them and they're just various, very um, charismatic uh, leaders. I, I knew I wanted to, to work there uh, after I got my, my bachelor's degree and, and there was good chemistry. And so I joined the organization 
at the same time, got a fellowship to do my master's at Western. And so it was really the, the, the best of all worlds for me. I was getting great, uh, great education, uh, great work experience, uh, five, six days a week, and I'm going to school in, in the evenings. And through that, I, I got, uh, I was going to go into finance, uh, maybe trading in the markets, stocks, uh, bonds, or, or derivatives. But I, I kind of got, I fell in love with healthcare. So the, the, the company, that little company in Matawan, Michigan, was doing uh, drug development and, and research for pharmaceutical organizations. And I just thought, wow, it's amazing that somebody with a business uh, education or background can help develop medicines that improve, extend, and, and maybe even save lives. And so uh, I really uh, developed a passion for healthcare. And from that organization, I went to a couple other organizations who are related to it. And uh, that, that led me eventually to Henry Schein, but through a course of career steps, but, but all with a great foundation. Um, I, I can point to just great educational experiences that prepared me for that, uh, what I think has a, been a pretty successful and very fortunate business career. That's excellent. M MPI, back, uh, a great connection here to uh, West Michigan, Derek. Yes. That's really yeah. great. That's really good. You want to go there? Do you have a question? Yeah. So, um, folks on healthcare, uh, take us from your time at MPI to your spot today as uh, in your current role, how you kind of climb that ladder and moved over there. Um, cause you know, exiting Western MPI to where you are today is a pretty big jump. Um, um or it's a pretty good career trajectory, if nothing else. And all, of, and, and, and all of our students want the secrets, right? The secrets to success. So what, what, are, the, what are the lessons you take away from that journey? So, so maybe the, the journey and a few lessons throughout. So at, at MPI, the owners of the, the, the company at the time had aspirations. Uh, they had done really well bringing it out of, it was a, I think IRDC was the name of the organization before MPI. They had purchased it out of bankruptcy and really reestablished it of being uh, a, a provider to pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. And they had aspirations for growth. And so they were either going to purchase, acquire, or merge with another organization that provided um, work in the clinical spectrum of drug development. And so they were looking at, at that company and were thinking of a transaction with them. And as they were doing that, uh, the two organizations got really, really close, and that organization needed a CEO and uh, a corporate executive team. They were planning a change, and so a gentleman from MPI went to that, that company, and he needed somebody to just help out uh, in business and finance, and so I went from MPI to that organization, which was called Clin Trials, and it was a big step, so I was kind of taking a leap of faith to go from an organization that I, I had really fallen in love with in terms of its team and culture to go to another on a potential transaction that was going to happen between two organizations. But I thought there was a promise of a lot of career experiences or exposures that I may not have had at MPI, just in terms of it was a global organization, uh, a different part of healthcare, a different part of drug discovery, uh, research and development. And so I took that leap of faith and indeed in that role, supporting the executive team, uh, in some ways as a chief of staff, I got a tremendous amount of experience in all the administrative disciplines in business. And I learned that later part of the drug development process. And so I would say taking a, a risk early on in your career, if it can give you broad exposure quickly, I thought that was a big win and a big lesson lesson in my career to say that you know taking a, a bold step or move early in, your, early in your career when you have plenty of time, even if it didn't work out, I had plenty of time to recover from a career perspective. That was a good learning and it opened up a whole host of doors because that organization was undergoing a lot of change and there was a lot of change in leadership and I served in a variety of interim capacities and so I got to learn a lot of different functional disciplines. And even in that, one, it seemed as though every time I got comfortable, uh, a gap would emerge and they would you know, tap me on the shoulder for an opportunity. And, and I would always say yes, because I figured I was early enough in my career. If I took, made a misstep, either in, in role or at the organization, uh, I could probably recover. And uh, so I, I continued that trend for three to four years. 
And that led to a lot of diversity in, in my career experience. So the second piece, uh, not only take risk, I would say that diversity and work experience serves me yet to this day, because if I'm dealing with an HR or legal or an information technology or a corporate governance matter, I, I can call back to those experiences that I had early on helping executives work through those. So I, I did that for several years, ended up being head of corporate administration for that organization, and they were purchased. Uh, so as head of corporate administration and business operations for that company, uh, that company was successful and kind of turning itself around and becoming who it needed to be. And they became so attractive that another organization bought them. That organization took it private. It was a foreign uh, organization or a non-US based organization, bought the company, um, took it private with the aspirations of, of going public or, or selling once again in three to four years. That organization, oddly enough, versus operating individuals or general managers, they'd like to pull people from with finance backgrounds from finance and administration and put them in business leadership roles. And so given that my background was finance, uh, taught well by Western, and I had a variety of, of experiences in the, in the corporate world there, they, they actually put me to head up a business, business operation for them on an interim basis as they made changes in the leadership team. I, I really hit uh, a good stride leading operations, kind of the core parts of, of clinical operations for that organization. And um, it worked out so well that I continued to grow in terms of the operating functions that I led in eventually leading operations for the Americas for, for a clinically focused research company supporting drug development organizations. And I would say really the what led to that success, and I think it was a great match for me, it was a great match for the organization, again, was, was being, being pretty bold or taking a pretty strong career move and going from the safety of kind of the business side or the administrative side of an organization, the corporate side of an organization, and jumping into a business operating role as a general manager, eventually a president for, for the Americas. It was into spaces, operating spaces. I had very little depth in directly, but I knew there were good team members there, good leaders there who all they would need is a good shepherd right? A good partner to work, develop a team atmosphere, uh, orient the, those operating functions towards where the organization was going and execute well. And I knew we'd be successful because the, the team members were that talented that they, they just need a little bit of leadership to, to orchestrate their activities across functions. And so that was successful. I ended up being head of the Americas for that organization. They, they did end up selling. So there was a successful exit for that organization. They were bought by a much larger organization in the space. And then I had a decision to make in my career. So I'd been working for about 15 years at the time. And I had a decision to make to say I could stay at that organization. And they, they'd offered me several corporate roles uh, because of, of some pretty diverse experience uh, relative to, to drug development at the time. Or I could do something very different. I, I was tapped on the shoulder by a, a, lead, a leader in the, the industry uh, kind of a competitor company, and they needed a head of operations for the laboratory business. It was a much larger business. It was in laboratory science and medicine, which was a different discipline than the one I was in. And it was based in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. The, and the company's name was Covance, and, and their most successful division was the laboratory business. So I took that change, and it was the, the only reason I took that change is just out of curiosity. I just thought what an amazing thing to learn a different part of drug development because I had I'd learned all these different parts of drug development early and late phase, but I didn't know the laboratory science, kind of the, the medical science uh, portion of drug development. And that would be a great way to learn it. And so I joined that organization, my family and I, I have a wonderful wife, Courtney, and we had a newborn son at the time, Connor. Um, and now he's, he's about 15 years old or almost 15 years old. So it was a big uh, family change for us and a big career move, but it was really out of curiosity and stretching my learning. Uh, I joined that organization and uh, can I, really. Can, can I jump in there? Because I, yeah, I, 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 I want to. I think this is a, you know the, this story is a great lesson for students 
uh, because and my wife and I, we, we talk about this frequently. Derek and I talk about this as well. I mean, he's my work wife, I guess, um, work husband is y- y- people say when you come to college, you're going to have these answers from these books. And once you know this, you're, you're prepared, but it's actually, we talk about, you know, the jungle in our program. It's, it is a world of discovery and you oftentimes you are, you, you fake it till you make it, you fake it till you become it. You're, you're not quite, you know, adapt at, at doing it, but it's, you're thrust in these experiences. And from that you, you learn, right. You learn by doing is, is, is how we, we think about it. What, what advice do you have for students who, who are, are, are scared of that experience where they're thrust off into the world with not, maybe not the preparation or the experience or, or the skills or the training. And now they're, they're moving into these new zones and that's going to happen throughout their career more and more. What, what lessons do you have on, on having that, the curiosity or the, the risk-taking to be able to do that successfully? Maybe to that point, just in terms of what would always made me feel comfortable or an observation was that the learners in the room are, are often the people who succeed. You know, the people that really feel they, they know everything, they have their, their, they have the handle on it, so to speak, or they, they have their hands on the handle and that they're, they're, they get overly confident, right? They're not challenging themselves to learn. And so the number one thing, I think if you are an avid learner and by learner, I mean that you're you know, pulling out books and just continually online learning things, but studying the environment that you're in. There's so much to learn in every business setting from others and from situational experiences you're you're having yourself. If you're a student or a study of the environment you're in, what's transpiring, pick out great practices by teams and leaders, you can thrive and and you can continue to grow in in your own role. So that would be the first thing. I think learners just, just thrive and those that challenge themselves and secondly, oftentimes people just need leadership. You get into these settings and people aren't leaning in and leading. And though, even if you don't have all the answers, even if frankly you have fewer answers than others in the room, a lot of people are just afraid to lead. They're very timid about leading. So if you're a learner, if you actually take opportunities and some risk about leading, I think oftentimes with a good educational background, reasonable head on your shoulders, you're going to do really, really well because you're doing something that others are not. That frankly provide you with a competitive advantage. And what does leader? I want to, and I, we might spend the whole podcast on, on this because I think it, it's so you're, you're really illuminating. I think what's critical for students, which is that they start that just this journey of, of you've done so many different things, even with a finance finance background. You know, one one thing I think that's that's not obvious is how do you lead in a context where you are still learning and you don't know, where everyone else in the room is still learning or, and and they don't know. What, what does great leadership look like, in, look like in that context? I think leadership in a context like that can be as simple as drawing out the best ideas from the team in front of you. Right? Oftentimes people are, are just are so concerned or focused on expressing their thoughts, their desires. They're actually not pausing a bit and, and actually realizing if you have a dozen people in the room, if you take the best ideas from six or seven of those individuals and, and put them together in a cohesive fashion, you actually have a plan or a course forward. And and I think really, really talented leaders, of course, they don't have all the answers, but they actually know how to listen. They have a discerning ear and and they're really good at at pulling together the right thoughts and a cohesive story. So it's very compelling, right? You you get this one plus one equals three effect if if you aggregate the best thinking from those around you. And there are very few people that can pull those seemingly disparate thoughts together into a cohesive story. And when you tell that back to people, one, it resonates with them because oftentimes it's, it's their own ideas or their own thinking. And then two, they haven't figured out how to piece it together with others, the best ideas from others, and they can rally around it, right? And it gives them confidence to say, that's a good plan. That's a great set of ideas. I think that's the course I want to follow. I can be motivated and excited by that. And I think that's what leaders do. You know, sometimes they're visionary and they insert these brilliant thought thinking that, that nobody else has ever thought of. But Oftentimes, good leaders are just taking the best of the things that are around them. I mean, this this learning by doing. So, so the situation you describe is the situation that our our students in our LBS program uh, face when they're when they're doing these consulting projects for companies, and it's it's a significant company with a significant question, and they look to Derek and I, and we don't have the answers, and and neither does the client, and so they're trying to you know to your point, 
forge that point of view from a lot of different ideas, different points of information, but taking a a point of view, a story and, and putting that together. We, we, we talk is, is so critical. Um, and we're, we're so appreciative too of, of, you know, the Coke family or the Cook family uh, scholarship that you guys help to create for our students, both uh, for them to be able to, to continue to strive uh, in our program and, and, and be able to travel and have those experiences. Do you, do you now knowing that, that experience, would you have done college differently? or look for college to do provide certain experiences for you, maybe in a different way to prepare you for that environment? You know, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, I enjoyed all the social aspects. I really was a social sponge, but I was really, a, a, when I was in class, I was kind of heads down. I was very, I, I took full advantage of it. So I really don't think I would do much differently you know, maybe, maybe stretching myself because I'm being in finance and, and maybe being a little bit more reserved or more of an introvert. Maybe I would have stretched myself in other areas that, that would have caused me to be a little bit more of an extrovert from a, from a networking or a social perspective in business. Um, or maybe had a little bit more diversity in my class schedule or something like that. But there's not a lot I would have changed. I, I just very engaging professors. And I, I think the, the environment that at least I was in, I'm, I think it's very much the same now. Yeah. Was, was very welcoming. It was warm. It was a safe environment to learn and to try and fail. I think that's, it's a very important thing in education and in the real world, uh, so to speak, to, to learn, to fail, to learn from that failure and to, to succeed after that. And I just felt it was a great environment to do it. So let's, let's kind of speed up to today now. So is there any key learnings from the last year? You're not back at work yet as, as a leader trying to lead remotely. Um, and then is there any plans at Henry Shine to talk for back to work? Are you, are you guys trying to learn from everyone's experience away and, and integrate them in what's, you know, for other leaders that are listening to, to the podcast, what, you know, what lessons do we have from a, the past year and what are you guys taking forward from that, that past year, year and a half? So one lesson for, for Henry Schein as an organization. So I, I went from those companies that I'd mentioned. Historically, a lot of the, the organizations I'd work with had a high proportion of their team members remote. It could be 60, 70, 80% remote. And you are very accustomed to working in very distributed leadership teams with distributed teams. That wasn't necessarily Henry Schein. There, there's a lot of field sales members or, and sales related team members in the field. There, there are service technicians and service experts in the field and folks within our distribution centers, but many of the leaders were consolidated into large locations, right? Where they had direct access and you know, just a lot of uh, social opportunities, hallway type conversations and engagements as, as well as in-person meetings. And the company's culture in some way was tied to that, that very personal relationship that leaders could forge with one another and with their teams. And, that, that was just a hallmark of the culture, right? Just proximity and, and interaction. So for Henry Schein, the vast majority of team members were, were office-based, uh, apart from our, our, our field-based team members. And the tenure was long within the company. So it's not as if they had just come to Henry Schein and had different experiences with remote working. And so for us to go from that to a matter of days, and the vast majority of team members are, are working, especially from a management perspective, are working remotely, it was a change. And I think the one thing that demonstrated is good organizations, when crises are at hand, when there's a crisis at hand that it needs to respond to, good organizations push through uncomfortable barriers, right? It, it wasn't comfortable for the team to jump into a remote working environment, frankly, maybe knock down some of the, the walls that, that maybe were just real versus perceived. And so a very traditional organization, very office space, very familiar, interpersonal to jump to this environment, it just shows that it can be done. And, and I actually think it, it, it caused us to pause a little bit as an organization, as a leadership team to say, and even personally to say, wow, if we were a little uncomfortable, if that wasn't us in the past and we can be this caused by a crisis, what else can we do? What are the other things that we as uh, individuals, as leadership teams, as a company, were hesitant to do, maybe even intimidated to do, that we can do now with this confidence? And, and that has sparked creativity, uh, innovation even in some cases, but also 
a, a lot of hunger for what's possible. And I think that was a huge, huge uh, catalyst for us as, a, as an organization. Yeah, that, that's my that's my gem of the that, that's my takeaway right there, Derek. <laughs> it, it's it, I, I think that is, is such a great insight, right? If we if look at what we did, and you push through those barriers and that 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 self reflection as a as an organization to say, well, what then could we do? And and but building up the confidence that to, to try take that next step to to take that next risk to take that next change. I think you hear a lot a lot of conversation of going back to normal. Right or things, look, and and I think you're speaking to the the virtue of seeing that as a a pathway for change, continual change. Yeah, and I think the the one thing there's just so many negative, uh, I mean, just very sad, negative, and and just horrific uh, effects of COVID. The one positive that we don't want to lose is it changed who we were in a good way as a leadership team to to say that we can do things that we we once thought were were not possible. And we're, we've tried to hang on to that because sometimes you get a little too comfortable or you get in a state, state of, well, we'll, we'll go back to, to what it was. We've really tried to beat that arm to say, um, let's not go back to quite that. Right. We're going to go back to being something different that we like. Uh, but it's a combination of those two things, liking who we were in the past and what we want to retain of that, but also some newfound skill that we have that, that'll be really important. Frankly, it'll help us be far more successful in the future, build upon a, a great track record of success for almost 90 years, right? So as a we're traditional at, organization. So we're at 4.30. Do you have any more time or we we're, we're, we should stop? You have, we're going to bump into your next meeting, I'm imagining. I, I have a few more minutes okay. if, if you guys want. Yeah. So we, I think I, well, I'll do one question and then we'll go, we'll go rapid fire if that's okay. Um, sure. So, you know, I think some folks, you know, you know, you know, Henry Schein, really, uh, uh, you know, ten billion dollar company in the dentistry space, um, and that's a that's a world that I think a lot of our listeners, you know, they're familiar with just in in a certain way, right? But I, I'd love for you to share maybe with listeners what's the most you know intriguing, surprising, counterintuitive you know, trend or happening that's going on in the dentistry space that people would be surprised or interested to, to learn about? I would say there's maybe a, a few things I would just throw out. Um, first, I think, I don't think a lot of people really realize the ties between oral health and, and total body health. There are just, a, there's a huge body of research and it continues to grow about how oral health and, and oral care really influence total body health. And it's just, it's been an eye-opening experience for me. So I'd really encourage people to, to ask their dentist, their oral health professional, uh, more about that, right? How, how can I improve my overall health through great oral care and through great professionals, dentists and, and otherwise? So that would be one. Second, dentistry was a really traditional um, profession, right? And, and I think it's it's very... Um, centered in the local community. Um, it, it, uh, it may not be perceived as progressive, progressive as, as some facets of healthcare. Um, to the, the point I mentioned a little earlier about what COVID in a positive way brought um, or, or you know, shed a positive light on with Henry Schein, the same has happened with dentistry. I think a lot of practices have really challenged themselves to say, while we've worked remotely, we've done telehealth or teledentistry. Uh, we've engaged uh, patients in, in a very different way. We've not lost a connection, even though we're not, we weren't able to see each, each other for a period of time or, or the, the distance between visits was, was maybe extended through COVID. How can we reinvent ourselves? And we're seeing a, a number of practitioners embrace digital tools, you know, interoral scanners and engaging customers or patients remotely. And so I think dentistry has challenged itself through COVID we're seeing uh, texts and, and patient uh, communication and reminders of various forms, uh, digital tools being implemented, practices, uh, efficiencies being driven to, to make the patient experience, you know, quick yet very effective and comforting to patients. So dentistry has challenged itself to take that next step. And so that would be a second point. And then third, you know, we often think about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we think about all these, these uh uh, worlds of advanced technology or different spaces, whether it be aeronautics or other things where these, these technologies are applied, there's a huge frontier in dentistry uh, to think about the, the many images that are taken, the, the data that are collected, 
how do you use machine learning and artificial intelligence to enhance the clinical uh, facets of dentistry and, and how can that advance the patient experience, right? Just going back to that original comment about the ties between oral health and whole body health. So that there is a world of, of science out there and technology that is on the horizon for dentistry. And, and so oftentimes people have this traditional picture of dentistry that uh, if they have that, I, I think that's going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, dentistry is going to take very significant steps forward in, in the coming months and years. And I think uh, those in the space, those coming into the space will lead us there. And it'll be great for patients and health. Wonderful. I agree a little. I have to give a shout out to my dentist and my kid's dentist. Pre-COVID, you'd sit there and fill out 10 forms and all this kind of, now I'm just texting my way in there. You know, yes. your, your appointment's in 10 minutes. I'm like on my way. Do you want to change your appointment? Show up right in, no forms anymore because I don't want you touching all the all the apparatuses. Get in. Is that fantastic? It's fantastic. And then I was, they took a digital image of my daughter's, uh, she's eight or nine. So that's because your first, I guess, total spin image, whatever. I, yes. I, I don't hear your industry, but they can now start tracing all kinds of future problems and try and get some earlier. I was, it was amazing. And then I left insurance. They already had <laughs> no forms again and, and you're gone. Um, so it was, I, I was impressed at the changes they made over, uh, over COVID, just my little community dentist. Um, it was impressive. Um, so and okay. it's just the start of it. I, I really believe it's just the start of it. And, and yeah, Henry Schein just has an amazing view of the entire dentistry space uh, through the technologies it offers, the equipment, the, the, the education and support that it offers practitioners. And again, I would say that, that, that is, that is an example of a step forward and there are many more and, uh, Oral health is exciting, and we're very pleased to be a part of it. Well, let's, uh, we've taken too much of your time. Uh, let's wrap up with uh, rapid fire. So these are one word, two word answers. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right. Favorite leader? Uh, person. So our current CEO, Stan Bergman, is, is an amazing, inspiring leader. And then another from my past would be Deb Keller, who is a, a local to the Western Michigan area. Wonderful. Uh, courage or compassion? Courage. Sometimes it takes courage to be compassionate. Speed or accuracy? Speed. Great ideas or great execution? Great execution. A word to describe your leadership style? Engendering followership. Followership. Okay. Night owl or early bird? Oh, early bird. Uh, are you an electronic or manual toothbrush person? Oh, electronic. All right. And, and wax or unwax floss? Currently, it would be waxed. I okay. actually don't know if that's good or bad, by the way. for I, my, I may get in trouble. I don't know if that's, that's a good or a bad thing. Okay. And I didn't know either when Doug, when Doug came up with the question. I, I mean, I, I would have picked woven because I'm a big woven fan, but that seemed, those seem phased out. But um, uh, you're in a dangerous jungle. You're going to, it's a difficult business task. You're walking into it. Who do you take with you? Who do I take with me? You can take anybody with you. Oh, it has to be my wife, Courtney, my life partner. Okay. And then if you had an animal that reflected your leadership, what would be that animal? You know, my son rides horses. And so I've uh, really come to appreciate horses and there are many uh, positive and, and inspiring facets. So I would say a horse actually. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, well, John Cook, Senior Vice President, CEO of uh, Henry Shine's Global Dental Group, two-time Bronco. Uh, so great for you to join us on the, on the podcast today. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Western's given me so much. I'm, I'm glad to give a, a little time out of my day for it. And if there's anything else I can do, I'd love to do it again. Really, thank you, gentlemen, for the time today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Go Broncos.